Father, we just come to you grateful for your word and for Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who is not only the way, but he's the truth. And you said that if we would abide in your word, we'd be your disciples and we would know the truth and the truth would set us free. So tonight we look to you to bring us the truth. We don't want just facts and we don't want conjecture. We want the Holy Spirit guided, inspired, anointed truth that brings forth deliverance and brings forth rhema, your personal word to us. So Lord, we look to you to do that. We look to you to bring that forth. Father, we thank you for this word tonight and we ask you to anoint it and to bring it forth by your spirit, not mine, so that you're glorified, not me, so that the cross is exalted and Jesus is lifted up. We ask you, Father, to have your way with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Tonight, as I said, we're going to look at the word Unix. And Unix is a, a very uh, uh, interesting topic in the Bible. There are two words used for eunuch, of course, in the uh, Hebrew and in the Greek. So it's used both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. In uh, the Old Testament, the word for Hebrew in Hebrew is the word saris. And uh, it means simply, actually the word in Hebrew and the word in Greek uh, are basically have the same meaning. But I'll just give you the, uh, the word. It's 5631 in Strong's in the Old Testament for saris. And it's 2135 as well as 2134. Just the two words, word by word. Just one's, a, I believe, like an adjective and the other one being the noun um, in uh, Greek. And in Greek, it's the word eunokos, uh, eunokos, uh, just which looks like the word eunuch with an OS on the end of it. So, uh, so it's very similar. It is, the word means, one thing it means is a castrated one, or a male who's castrated, which is our typical understanding of the word eunuch in English. But it also means a valet or a courtier, which of course is a person who, is a, uh, who holds court, a person who holds court. The reason it meant a valet or a courtier is because this is a person, the word eunuch is made up of two words, it, the, they are the words bed and to hold. Bed, B-E-D, and to hold. And so the word eunuch combined really means somebody who could hold a bed. Now what that implied or what that's all about is that when a king in a foreign nation had a harem, it was these men that he could trust to oversee the harem and he knew that this man would not be then uh, molesting his wives, molesting his harem. It was somebody who could be trusted to hold the bedchamber, somebody who could watch over it. And because that person would be uh, high in rank, somebody that would be given a lot of trust to be overseeing the queen or all of the princesses or all of the concubines of the king of the land, um, that person was a pretty influential in a, a person in the land and also in a high position. And many times that person might then be promoted. Maybe they become a general or maybe they become uh, some other kind of high official and yet that title, uh, Saris or eunuch, would still be their title. They would still be called that. Many times they were in fact somebody who had been conquered from another land and they were castrated and then put in that position. So the eunuch could be a heterosexual. The eunuch could be, in fact, any kind of sexual orientation. It doesn't really state what they would be. But it also uh, could be a gay person because a gay person would be somebody who could be trusted uh, in, a, in a, a harem, watching over a harem. A male uh, homosexual would be able to watch over a harem and the king wouldn't really worry about that person. They'd be okay with them. So, and that was also a common practice. That was not uncommon. So uh, another word, uh, it's the word eunuch in Strong's Concordance is defined this way. Anyone trusted to hold a women's, uh, a, uh, a harem, a women's bed, meaning holding a bed. It also means to castrate. And Strong's also says it also means these things. It also means to live unmarried. The word eunuch means to live unmarried. And it also means an impotent or an unmarried man. Now, there's another uh, thing we talked about, another book, another lexicon that we've mentioned. 
uh, early in the series, and that was Thayer's. Thayer's. Thayer is another uh, scholar who gives us other definitions of these Greek and Hebrew words. And Thayer says uh, the definition of the Greek word for eunuchus is one who is naturally incapacitated, either for marriage or for begetting children. I'm going to say that again because that's very important. So that's how you begin to see that this is gay people as well as people who are castrated. One naturally incapacitated, either for marriage or for begetting children. And another thing that Thayer gives as a definition for eunuchs is one who abstains from marriage. So one who abstains from marriage but can be trusted to hold wives' bed or to watch over a harem. So you've got a pretty unique, uh, try not to make a pun here, but a pretty unique situation in terms of uh, uh, who this person is. So you can see that really it could very well be gay people, in fact it was, as well as people who in whatever reason or capacity or for whatever situation in life. So you might have uh, uh, an asexual person, a person who just didn't have really any sexual orientation or any interest in sex of any kind, or a bisexual person whose primary focus was uh, people of the same sex. So whoever they were, they could be trusted to, uh, to watch over the harem. That, in general terms, in many situations, that's who we're talking about. Um, to prove to you or to show you, as we begin looking in the Word tonight, to show you some of the scriptures that show that this is not always talking about a castrated male. We're looking at the Second Kings, chapter 20, uh, one of the first places that we'll look at tonight that talks about the word eunuch. We're just going to see the word eunuch. Uh, but the reason we're looking at this is because it'll show us that this is not, we're not talking about um, Second Kings, chapter 20, verses 16 to 19. So I'm going to turn there, if you'll turn there with me, 2 Kings 20, verse 16. And that reads this way. And Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, who was the king in Judah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried unto Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. Here's our key verse 18. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. And he said, Is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? So here is the word of the Lord coming to King Hezekiah saying, Your sons are going to be eunuchs. And Hezekiah says, Well, that's great. Well, if it meant that his sons were going to be castrated, I don't think he'd be saying, Well, isn't that exciting? Uh, you know, he's not, so he's, in his mind, he's thinking it just means somehow there'll be uh, courtiers, there'll be valets, they'll be able to be high officials in the king of Babylon's realm. So there's the word eunuch, it's, there is, it is 5631 in Hebrew, and uh, there it is. Uh, being used and Hezekiah goes well that's great so if it was meaning that his boys are going to be castrated he wouldn't be saying well hey, praise God <laughs> you know you can see that no parent would say that but he's he understands that the words got a broader concept so he's thinking well his sons will probably be high officials high officials okay we look at um, Matthew chapter 19 and I remember this word was probably the first word that opened my eyes to this whole concept of eunuchs being something other than a castrated man. Because here's Jesus now. If you've got a red letter edition, this will be Matthew 19, 12. We'll pick up with verse 10, though. And Jesus is talking. He's talking to his disciples, and they're discussing marriage and divorce. And uh, what... Uh, under what conditions can a person get divorced and, and Jesus begins to show that really unless, uh, unless your spouse has cheated on you you don't have a reason to get divorced and uh, they're thinking well this is a pretty uh, difficult uh, lifestyle to stay married under all circumstances in spite of anything and they, they don't like all this word so they're discussing this and then Jesus comes along in the middle of this verse and he says something that, uh, about eunuchs 
just right in the middle of all of this passage. So in 19, beginning with verse 10, it says, And his disciples said unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, except they to whom it is given. Now verse 12 just simply stands on its own. Jesus is just thinking suddenly about people who don't get married. And you'll see him giving the reasons why some people don't get married. And he says, for there are some eunuchs which were so born for the, from their mother's womb. And there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men. And there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Now you look at that and you can understand immediately that he's not talking about physical castration. Why do we know that? Because the last group of people, he says there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. Nowhere, nowhere in the Bible does God require people to mutilate themselves, to mutilate their bodies in order to somehow get favor in the kingdom of God. Yet Jesus said there are eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs. If we were talking about castrated men, you would see that is absolutely not true. In fact, there was one man in all of human history, in the church's history, his name was Origen, I believe that's who it was that, uh, that I've read about, that took this, said, oh, I suppose I should make myself a eunuch for the sake of the kingdom of God, and absolutely went through the process. And we're looking at the, uh, we're looking at the, first, the first few centuries of the early church history, and as no sooner did he do it as he realized what a hideous mistake he'd made. You know, what a horrible mistake he'd made. And the, nowhere does God, you know, say, you know, chop off a hand, uh, chop, pluck out your eyeballs, do these sorts of things in order to get into heaven. You don't have to do those things for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. How do you get into heaven? It's not by uh, chopping off parts of your body or anything like that. That's why people who at Easter time or Good Friday in South America who take uh, uh, crowns of thorns and put them on themselves and walk on nails or take a cross up to the top of a hill in uh, Brazil or Chile or wherever, Argentina, and crucify themselves with nails to crosses on Good Friday thinking somehow that makes themselves more spiritual or takes whips and just, you know, whip their back until their back is a bloody pulp and they're bleeding all over the place. That doesn't get them any brownie points in the kingdom of God. So we know that Jesus is not talking about a physical, literal eunuch. He's talking about a broad category of people. So people who make themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of God are going to be people like the Apostle Paul, who chose not to marry so that he could travel, he could go all around the known world, all through Asia and Asia Minor, and could go up into Spain and get up to England and do all the things that he did and travel because he didn't have to worry if the Roman Empire would flog him one more time or if he had to deal with sharks or deal with robbers or deal with his countrymen, be let down in a basket and have to worry about his little kids and his wife. So he made himself a eunuch. In other words, an unmarried man or somebody who uh, forgoes uh, marriage for the sake of the kingdom of God. So now knowing that we're looking at a broader category, we look back in this same verse and we see what else did it say? There are some eunuchs who were so born from their mother's womb. There you've got a gay person. A person who's born that way. They could be a gay person or they could be someone who was born as a eunuch. But for whatever reason, remember that the, one of the definitions according to Thayer was a person who was naturally incapacitated either for marriage or for begetting children. So there you are. There's either a gay person or somebody who actually uh, uh, has a biological or physiological reason why they can't have children. So Jesus says there are people that are born that way. Then he says there are people who were made that way by other people that were made eunuchs of men. So in other words, because of human uh, Intervention, whether it's uh, actual literal castration, as in the case of ancient uh, Asian courts or whatever was taking place, or because of, you know, some people, you know, just don't relate to the opposite sex because of abuse and things that happened in their childhood and their scars and the things that they just remain a single person the rest of their life. And that would include women, see? So we've got 
uh, we've got just a broad category and Jesus just kind of lumps them all together and what he really is saying here is that there are a lot of people that won't get married and can't get married or shouldn't get married. Though God's plan initially when he created two people was for there to be marriage and though and when they get married here's his plan one mate for life that's his plan so that's what God uh, just kind of spells out and Jesus pours out there so now we see that we're not you know we're just talking about people now when we talk about the word eunuch and that's what we need to understand before we go back and look at any other scriptures when we look at eunuch, we're looking at people who really cannot get heterosexually involved. So that, I think that, is that clear to everybody before we go on? Because that's what I want you to understand or else it won't make too much sense otherwise. All right, there are, there are some other scriptures that use the word uh, eunuch or talk about a person who is uh, wounded or incapacitated uh, to beget children and in the law, the Old Testament law, in Leviticus chapter 21, verse 17 to 23, the Lord is giving some instruction about the priests. So he's not giving instruction about everybody in the body, everybody in the nation of Israel, but just for the priesthood. And he's giving some instruction that those priests, Leviticus 21, 17 to 23, that those priests Priests in order to come into the Holy of Holies. Priests who come in behind the veil in order to make sacrifice for the sins of the nation have to be absolutely perfect in their physical stature. They're not allowed to have any kind of defect of any sort. And that's what this word talks about. So it says, as we pick up 21.17, speak to Aaron. Aaron was the first high priest, saying, Whosoever that is of your seed, any of your children, in their generations that has any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. In other words, this, if any priest, the priesthood was descended through Aaron, any one of Aaron's sons who is going to be a priest, don't let him ever come in to offer God's uh, offering if he's got any kind of blemish. For whatsoever man he be that has a blemish, he shall not approach a blind man, a lame man, he that has a flat nose, or anything superfluous, or a man that is broken-footed, or broken-handed, or crook-backed, or a dwarf. So you see, these aren't things that say that these people are bad. It's not, a dwarf is not a bad person, or somebody with a crooked back is not a bad person or a broken hand. But simply the Lord is saying, because he's saying that that person who goes in to make sacrifice for the nation has to be a perfect person. The reason is the priesthood was a foreshadowing of what God was going to do in Jesus. And Jesus was going to be the perfect sacrifice. And so what he sets up in the law is simply a shadow of what he's going to set up for eternity for the redemption of the human race. So he sets it up so that it's not acceptable to have any kind of person with anything other than perfection to go in there. And of course we know Jesus was sinless, Jesus was perfect. So not a crookback, he has a blemish in his eye or scurvy or a scab or has his stones broken, which of course means the person is, is a eunuch. For all intents and purposes, he's not able to reproduce. Therefore, he doesn't qualify for the priesthood. Uh, he can be a priest, but he can't get into the Holy of Holies, bringing in that sacrifice. No one that has a blemish of the seed of Aaron, the priest, shall come near to offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire. He that has a blemish shall not come near to offer the bread of his God. He shall eat the bread of his God, both of the most holy and of the holy, only he will not go in unto the veil. So in other words, when the sacrifice is finally uh, divided up and the priest take that food of the ox or the, the lamb or whatever home to eat, this person will, the dwarf, the blind, the one with a crooked uh, or broken hand, or the one whose stones are broken, the eunuch, they will all be able to eat. From, God will provide for them. And he's not saying that they're bad people or that they're evil or wicked. He's just saying they're not coming behind that veil. That's all he's saying in the law. 
Now remember, the law only is set up as a foreshadowing of what the Lord's going to do. In Deuteronomy, uh, the sec which is the second telling of the law, in chapter 23, verse 1, Here's an even stricter, uh, a stricter word on someone who's wounded in his private parts. It says, he that is wounded in the stones, or that has, the King James says, hath his privy member cut off, shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Now the reason that verse is important is because this first is saying in the law, based on the law, legally, this person's not going to even be a part of the congregation if they've had this kind of injury. But it does say later on in, this, in a promise later on to the eunuch, don't say I'm a dry tree. God has a promise. Under the law, which uh, is, is, has certain blessings to it by following the law, there are certain blessings, but we are told in the New Testament we're under a better covenant. And the better covenant gets fulfilled through Christ. So um, there are, that's all that the law says about these individuals, that they can't be a priest. And when it says they can't enter the congregation, it doesn't mean that they can't be a part of the nation. There are lots of places that a person, now this is, this is we're not talking necessarily about a gay person, we're just talking about a person who's injured in, uh, in his private area. So that this person is not able to come into the temple to worship but it doesn't mean he can't be ministered to, and it doesn't mean that he can't be a part of what's going on in the nation. Certainly he's not being expelled from the nation of Israel, which was the people of God at that time. So we look at, those are the law, that's all that it says. There's nothing more, there's no condemnation on these people. There's nothing being said that, uh, you know, we never want to see them, you know, kill them, stone them, like we looked at other people try to pull those passages and say, this is what has to happen, you need, they, they need to die, throw them in a concentration camp, get rid of these folks expel them, get them off the church rolls. It's nothing like that. Um, just in some very specific situations. The word saris, the Hebrew word, in the Old Testament shows up again in Genesis 39. And uh, it just is simply the story of Potiphar. You remember Potiphar? Joseph, one of the 12 sons, goes into captivity. He's sold by his brothers. Uh, and he's sold into slavery into Egypt. And when he goes into Egypt, he is sold as a slave to an Egyptian man named Potiphar. And Potiphar, it says in verse 1, was a saris. So it depends on your translation. Your translation may say that he was an official. Or it might say he was a eunuch. But it's that word eunuch. So here's Potiphar who is a eunuch. And all of a sudden we come across this story where his wife, is always trying to seduce Joseph, their slave. And some people have put forth the hypothesis. We don't know why was she trying to do that. You know, that would be reading between the lines. It doesn't say in the Bible her motivation, but it does say he was a saris. It does say he was a eunuch. So it could mean that he was impotent. It could mean that he was unable to fulfill his duties as a husband to his wife, and therefore, she was always trying to get somebody. She was, you know, a very frustrated woman, and therefore sought the, uh, the availability of Joseph, who was very virile. It said he was a good-looking young man and uh, handsome, and so apparently that may have been a good, plausible reason why she was trying to seduce him. And uh, uh, we don't know if that's a fact. We do know that he was a cerise. We don't know what she was thinking, but we do know that she did try to seduce a man in the house and her husband was a eunuch. So, there's one situation. Um, you know, so we don't know what that was all about, but we could infer anything we wanted to. So just let that sit in your spirit and think about that for a while. I want to look at a, a far more convincing situation though at a, with a eunuch. And we look in Daniel. I know a lot of people are going to smile thinking about this story already. That's a good one. Daniel chapter 1. Daniel was a man of God. Daniel was one of the um, Hebrew boys that were brought into captivity to Babylon when Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians. 
I'm going to read you verses 8 to 15 so that we'll look at the story and see what it says here. I'm reading from King James still. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. So when he's in Babylon, he doesn't want to eat what the Babylonians eat. He wants to eat what it said in the law of God that he was to eat, nor the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. So who he's talking to is the one who is a eunuch, who is a prince over the eunuchs, which means that it's considered that Daniel is a eunuch. Daniel is considered a eunuch, so he goes to his boss because he has to ask for permission to not eat what they're supposed to eat in Babylon because he wants to obey the law of God. So he asked, per, requested permission of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now listen to verse 9 in King James. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love. God did this. God brought Daniel into tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who has appointed your meat and your drink, and why should he see your face as worse uh, than all the children which are of your sort? Then he'll make me endanger my head. You'll make me endanger my head to the king. And Daniel said to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Prove your servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. And that let our countenances or our faces be looked upon before thee, etc., etc., etc. So he's asking him, you look at us and see after ten days if we don't look better than everybody else if we eat God's diet instead of the king of Babylon's diet. And the prince of the eunuchs says, well, all right. But it's important here, verse 8 uh, says some pretty Im important things. I'm going to look at the two words there that uh, it says in, or in verse 9, I'm sorry. God brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. The first word is, God brought Daniel into favor. Favor in Strong's is 2617. It's the word in Hebrew, uh, chasid. Uh, it means, listen to what this word means, favor. It means everlasting love, an attitude of love which contains mercy. It means unfailing love. It is the kindness of men toward men in doing favors and benefits. And another thing Brown Driver Briggs, Hebrew lexicon says this word means, is lovely appearance. Interesting concept. So in other words, if you took lovely appearance and translated it that way, it would say that God brought Daniel into a lovely appearance with the prince of the eunuchs. In other words, the prince of the eunuchs, this eunuch, this person who could not have children, looked at Daniel and said, aren't you hot? <laughs> cute, cute number, pretty, good looking thing. That's what he's saying, a lovely appearance. And with that came an emotional attachment of unfailing love. Now that's just the word favor. We haven't got the tender love yet. The other word. God did this. God brought Daniel into favor, into lovely appearance, into an attitude of love which contains mercy, into unfailing love. In other words, this, this prince of the eunuchs, who was not a Hebrew, who had no reason to uh, stick his neck out for a slave, had no reason to stick his neck out for a foreigner who'd been captured and who has, because he's a eunuch, he's high, a high official. He is the prince over all of the eunuchs, the chief eunuch. And he's willing, because of his emotional attachment to Daniel, to stick his neck out. He said that in the word that we looked at, that the king might just chop his head off for doing this. But he's willing to risk his life because of how he loves Daniel. He's in love with Daniel. That's what it's saying. So God, and God takes responsibility in the word of God for causing that to happen. Remarkable. Tell me God doesn't appreciate gay love. So, now it doesn't say that Daniel was gay, but it does certainly imply that the prince of the eunuchs was because he's so emotionally attached 
that he just can't help himself. He don't care if it cost him his head or anything. He'll do whatever Daniel wants. And God brought him into that kind of favor. Um, if we looked at Daniel 1.4, well, I know we're gonna, but we're gonna, we will get to it, don't you worry. I haven't, we haven't forgotten it. In Daniel 1.4, I wanna tell you what NIV says. Because remember we said that the, the one thing favor meant is lovely appearance, lovely appearance. So in Daniel 1.4, this is confirmed because in Daniel 1.4, talking about them, in the NIV, it said that they were handsome and without physical defect, without physical defect. So in other words, when you looked at Daniel, Dan Daniel was a good looking young man and he didn't have a defect in him. In other words, he was just pure 100% all beef or whatever, you, whatever <laughs> they'd say, and, you know, just Pure all male, nothing, you know, no defect in him. Perfect male specimen, that's what he was. No physical defect and handsome. And it says, then God brought him into, into favor. God brought Daniel into lovely appearance in the heart, in the mind of the prince of the eunuchs, okay? So uh, it also said that he was quick to understand. And I think you have to take that into consideration when Daniel's asking this prince of the eunuchs for permission to break the law of the land of Babylon. He probably understands. It says he was quick to understand in verse 4. So it probably means Daniel wasn't too dumb. He was pretty smart. He knew what was happening. He knew the score. And so he could probably figure out how this prince felt about him. And because he knew that, he thought he could probably risk his own life in asking the question, is it okay if I don't eat this stuff? Which the king has commanded me to eat. Is it okay with you if I don't eat this stuff? And the prince says, the prince of the eunuchs says, well, you know, this could cost me my life. And Daniel says, yeah, I know, but for me. And he says, well, all right, for you. And it happens. It takes place. Interesting. And then it says uh, in verse 1, 7, that unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. So he was the prince. I wanted to just reiterate that. He gave them their names. So he had a lot of authority over them. He, con he was prince over eunuchs. So Daniel was also considered a eunuch. The prince of the eunuchs, meaning the chief of eunuchs. He was a eunuch and he was over eunuchs. So he was a eunuch, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were eunuchs also. And that's also confirmed because nowhere in the word of God is Daniel's wife, there is no Mrs. Daniel, nor is there a Mrs. Shadrach, Meshach, or Abednego. Nowhere. They're never mentioned. And yet other prophets I mean, Peter had a mother-in-law, Peter had a wife. We know, you know, different ones had wives and et cetera, but not Daniel, never, never, ever mentioned in any way, shape, or form. Let's go on then with the same verse. We want to see the second word in Daniel 1.9. So we see that God brought Daniel into favor. Now the second word is and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. God brought Daniel into favor lovely appearance and tender love. Tender love is 7356. And if you've ever been in this series before, I gave you a wrong number in the past. Because in the, in the Strong's Concordance, when you look up uh, this word tender or the word love, uh, there actually is nothing there. And the reason is the word tender is not in the original translation and the word love is not in the translation and I had assumed not fully understanding how to use the strongs that the number right above it was the number and so therefore I gave you those numbers in the past and then defined those numbers so I had to look into the line by line word by word uh, uh, linear Bible in order to find out what word really was there. That's how I've discovered this. So it is 7356 and this word uh, is just comes from a root word which is the number right above it 7355. 7355 is the word to fondle. To fondle. 
so God brought Daniel to be somebody who he thought was absolutely loved and somebody he could fondle. Now that's, what is that saying? Well, these are two butch heterosexual men who wouldn't dare touch each other, I know that. <laughs> well, that doesn't seem to be implied in the Word of God. It certainly doesn't seem to be implied in Hebrew. You got two heterosexual things. That's all right. <laughs> But we may not have two right here. That's the point. <laughs> this word, 7356, rakam, is interestingly, uh, it's an interesting thing because this word gets used almost like it's two different words. Uh, well, I, the best I could spell it is, is R-A-C-H-A-M would be the best I could spell it, Rakam. Um, it, it's used almost like two different kinds of words. The one way it's used, if you look the word 7356 up in your uh, lexicon to find every time that word is used, you'll find it several places used as the word womb, W-O-M-B, womb, meaning that there is a motherly feeling or uh, uh, the feeling of a, a mother or somebody who uh, it, it will, the word womb will be used there. Sometimes in the Old Testament when the word womb is used, this is the word that's used. Um, but it also gets translated as compassion or love. This is the word that is used in Lamentations chapter 3 verse 22 when it says about God that his compassions fail not. So how deep is that? Lamentations chapter 3 verse 22 his compassions they fail not. How deep is that? You know when we're talking about God and his compassion and here's this word womb somehow attached as a motherly feeling that just won't go away. Deep, deep, deep kind of love. In fact, it's also translated as the word sensitive love. And it's from the word to fondle. Very, very intimate. Very, very intimate word. So, God brought Daniel. Now, that's the most amazing thing, isn't it? God did this. God takes credit for this and says, I did this. I made the prince of the eunuchs yearn after him and want to have deep, deep, deep motherly, fondling, compassionate love, sensitive love towards him. And thought he was lovely. And God says, I did it. It's wonderful. What an affirming passage that is. Now that would be a great one and we could stop there and all just have a spell and and just go home from that. But that isn't all that God's Word said. We go to the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah 56, there is a promise to eunuchs. And this promise, remember that we had already seen what the law said, that anybody who had any kind of uh, 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 mutilation or any kind of uh, injury in their private area was not even going to be allowed in the congregation. And so that person or the eunuch then feels like, well, hey, what hope is there for me? I can't get into the temple. I can't worship God. If I'm a descendant of Aaron, I'll never be allowed to get inside the, uh, inside the, the, the veil, behind the veil in order to offer sacrifices. I'm considered imperfect. Though I'm not a bad person, I'm considered imperfect. What hope is there for me? What promise is there for me? And so the eunuch ends up feeling like he has no hope. There's no place for him. Now, as we read this promise to the eunuch, beginning in Isaiah 56, verse 3 to verse 8, this promise is only being fulfilled in our day. Look at this, chapter 3. I mean, chapter 56, verse 3. Neither don't let the son of the stranger, the heathen, the alien, the stranger, that hath joined themselves to the Lord, speak, saying, The Lord has utterly separated me from his people. 
Neither let the eunuch say, the cerise, say, behold, I am a dry tree. Now, wouldn't a eunuch, a person who's incapable of fathering children, say, I'm a dry tree? He could. But the word says, don't let him say that. Why? For thus says the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant. Now, we'll stop right there for a minute. Now, this is not a promise to all eunuchs, to all gay people, to all bisexuals and asexuals and transsexuals. It's not a promise to all. It's only to all who will take hold of his covenant. What's his covenant? Jesus Christ of Nazareth crucified for our sins. That's the only covenant God gave the human race, right? So to the eunuch who will grab a hold of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, grab a hold of the hem of his garment and not let go. To the eunuch who will take hold of his covenant and his Sabbaths. In other words, I want to worship God. I want to get in God's house. I want to be with God's people. To this person, God says, even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters. Who are sons and daughters? All the other folks, the folks who are able to reproduce, the folks who are able to have children, okay? I will give them within my walls and within my house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and daughters, and I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Well, you see right now the church is acting like they have a name that is cut off. The church is acting like they have no place in the house of God. The church is acting like they don't belong to God. They can't belong to God. Yet God says, if the eunuch will grab a hold of the covenant, if the eunuch will grab a hold of the fact that Jesus Christ of Nazareth died for their sins as well as the sins of the whole world and will receive Jesus as anyone else, son or daughter, would receive Jesus as Savior, as Lord, then that eunuch is going to get a name that's better than that of sons and daughters. What that says is there's a revival that's coming. And the revival comes through the eunuch because the eunuch has got the name that is the name you've got to get through. If you want to be a part of the last day revival, you've got to get through what God's doing in the eunuch community. Now, what that's saying? And I always looked at that and I thought for the longest time, I, I had read this and read this and read this. You know how sometimes you'll just read it and you've got blinders on. You just don't see what it says. You think you see what it says. And I've read this probably for 15 years and one day the blinders came off and I went, oh my goodness. Because I always, I'll tell you what I thought it said was that God will give eunuchs a name that is better than that of sons and daughters, period which I thought meant that God would raise up churches within the gay community or within the community of, of people of sexual minorities, and those churches would somehow be a better church than other churches. That's what I thought it said. Wrong. What it says is that within my house, God's only got one house. There's only one church. And within my walls. So in other words, where it is that sons and daughters worship, which is why we have heterosexuals in our congregation, wherever it is that the people of God gather, bar none, that within that house, God will give them a name that is better than that of sons and daughters. Which means that in the last day revival, God has not put aside sons and daughters. God has not said, sons and daughters, now you step aside while I move through eunuchs. God has said, I'm going to move through all of you. But, you know, it says in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 12, about different parts of the body, that there are parts of the body who don't seem very seemly or aren't very much appreciated or seem like you, you want to cover them up. Those are the parts that God says he gives more honor to. Doesn't he say that in 1 Corinthians 12 about the parts that don't seem to have much honor? That he gives more honor to them. Now, are those parts of the body that we cover up because we don't want anyone to see them? Are those the parts of the body separated and amputated from the body? Not if they're alive. They're very much a part of the body. So what God does in the body is he takes those parts that everybody has scorned and said, oh, you don't want to look at this thing. You don't want to look at this part of the body. And suddenly given them honor. 
suddenly honored them, suddenly given them, but within the body. So you see that there is something that's stirring in the spirit that God's got to do that will not be a, there will, the phenomenon that we now experience of a gay church and a non-gay church. That has got to end. There has got to be a day where bridges are built and God's church is simply God's church. Read on. Even unto them I will give uh, in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and daughters and I will give them an everlasting name that will not be cut off. So as God gives this name, they don't get thrown out anymore. Okay. Also the sons of the stranger, which are the people who feel like they don't fit in that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and takes hold of my covenant, grab a hold of that again, it's not just everybody who feels misplaced, but those who feel misplaced but take hold of his covenant. Even them I will bring, not set up something different somewhere else, I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer, not houses of prayer my one house of prayer. And their burnt offerings and their sacrifice shall be accepted upon my altar, for my house shall be called. Now God prophesies this. It shall be. It shall be called. A house of prayer for who? For all people. Right? So God is saying, He's going to set something up. So we've never seen this happen. But we're starting to see it happen in this generation. We're starting to see it happen. And God's been deliberately building. Over the last 25 years, God's been saving, delivering, filling with the Holy Spirit people who are eunuchs. According to the Bible definition. And then God has been bringing together people who are not eunuchs, sons and daughters and bringing them to his house of prayer. God's concept is there's one place and he wants every part of his body together. He doesn't want them separated. He wants every part together to worship him in what he calls his house of prayer. Go on to verse 8. The Lord God which gathers the outcasts. Isn't that wonderful? He gathers the outcasts which implies, first of all, that they were thrown out. Second of all, that they weren't welcome back. But third of all, he brought them in. The Lord God which gathers the outcast of Israel says, yet will I gather others to him besides those that are gathered unto him. So we haven't seen anything yet. Everyone who feels disenfranchised, Everyone who feels somehow like they're just not been a part. Everyone who feels like they just can't worship together with the rest because of whatever's gone on. God says, I will gather. Yet others, you haven't even imagined, I haven't even imagined yet. God gave us prophecy through Brother Ronnie Pig of people we hadn't even con concerned ourselves with yet that he said would be coming in. Real oddballs in society's concept of what's normal. In society's concept of what's acceptable. In society's a concept of what's, what you should attain toward. Those who just don't fit in. God says, I gather. So, you know, we should expect and have our eyes opened and our heart open to God to bring in anybody. Anybody at all. Because it becomes one house of prayer for all people. So that's a promise to eunuchs. Now... Let's go on. Look at chapter 8 of the book of Acts. <laughs> Acts chapter 8. And ask, answer this question. What comes first? Acts chapter 8 or Acts chapter 10? It's tough, I know. <laughs> what do you think? Take a wild guess. 
10, you're wrong. It's Acts chapter 8. Depends if you're reading from the back to the front or the front to the back. But if you're reading from the front to the back, then Acts 8 is going to come first. Acts 8, therefore, occurred historically before Acts chapter 10 occurred. Acts chapter 10 was a watershed moment in the history of the church. Because up until that moment, the church was considered to be a Jewish phenomenon. When Acts chapter 10 comes along, suddenly the church is no longer a Jewish phenomenon, but it becomes, in fact, a worldwide phenomenon because God opens the church to somebody, only one person in this church can imagine who the name of that person might be. Hey, there she is, waving her hand. Cornelius. <laughs> Cornelius becomes a, a Gentile who is converted with his household, is filled with the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden the church is no longer Jewish, but it's Jewish and Gentile. Prior to that ever taking place, Acts chapter 8. Pick up with verse 27. I'll, I'll pick up a 26. It's a little easier flowing. And the angel of the Lord spoke unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goes down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is the desert, which is desert. And he arose and he went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, which is a man of color. It's an African man. Here is a man of Ethiopia, comma, a eunuch, oh my, of great authority, oh my. <laughs> I mean, you talk about all minorities being wrapped up into one here. People you just don't expect to be people in power and authority or God to be concerned with because these are, every one of those people listed there are people that the church at one time or another said God doesn't care about. Every one of them. So an Ethiopian, a man of color, an African man of color, and a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem to worship. Uh, remember the eunuch who would grab a hold of his covenant and honor the Sabbath? He was returning and sitting in his chariot reading Isaiah the prophet, not Micah. Not Malachi, but Isaiah. What's in Isaiah? Isaiah 56 is the promise to the eunuch that we just looked at. Here he is in his chariot. Now, a, 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 the book, to, for him to be reading Isaiah was not for him to be reading a Bible in Hebrew. It was for him to be reading a scroll and that scroll, in modern day terminology, was so expensive that most churches only had one or two when the Gospels were first established. The, maybe the church, remember Paul said, now you also read the letter that went to Laodicea, and you read theirs, and they read yours. The reason is, in our occasion, in our finances today, if you wanted to have the Gospel of Matthew, you would only have it. And it would be a scroll, and you would just unroll it, and you'd unroll it. And it was made on papyrus, which was very, very expensive to make. So the book of Matthew in, um, I believe it was $1978, would have cost us $53,000 to own in 1978 dollars. So here he is with the book of Isaiah the scroll with the Isaiah. So naturally, all of Isaiah would have been on there, and he would have read it, and read it again, and read it again, and read it again. So while he's in his chariot reading this passage, he's reading Isaiah 56, and he reads about the promise to the eunuch. And he has to figure out, well, what is the covenant that I've got to get a hold of? So what happens when you've got a question about something in the Word that you've read and you know that it's already referenced to earlier. You're going to back up 
and look and see, well, I wonder what the covenant is. Wouldn't you ask yourself that kind of question? Gee, I really want this. I want to know. I want to know this covenant. So you look and you go and you back up. We come to the, uh, he's returning in the chariot, verse 28, reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit says unto Philip, go near, join yourself to this chariot. Here's a Jew now going to join up with a eunuch. Interesting. And the spirit says, join yourself to this chariot. Philip runs to him and hears him read the prophet Isaiah. I'm sure that he was quite amazed that what is this folk doing reading the word of God? What is he doing reading that? But he was reading it. And he said to him, do you understand what you read? And he said, oh, well, how can I except someone should guide me? And he desired Philip that he'd come up and sit with him. And the place of the scripture which he read was this, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who will declare to his generation for his life is taken from the earth? And the eunuch asked Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? And Philip opened his mouth and began at that same scripture. You know what that scripture is? That scripture is Isaiah 53. Just a few short verses away from Isaiah 56. Not too far. In fact, on a scroll, it's just going to be a few lines. Just a few lines away. And here he is reading about Jesus going to the cross, which is what Isaiah 53 is all about, and how on the cross our sins were taken care of, and by, uh, like a lamb, uh, taken away, uh, dumb before his shearer, he didn't open his mouth. The whole thing of the cross, the crucifixion, is prophesied in Isaiah 53. You can't read Isaiah 53 and see anything but the cross of Jesus. So he's reading this, and it says, Then Philip, verse 35, opened his mouth, began at the same scripture, and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came to certain water, and the eunuch said, watch this question. The eunuch said, see, here's water. What does hinder me from being baptized? And Philip could have said, well, you're a eunuch. <laughs> Eunuchs can't get in the church. Well, what's the matter with you? He could have said, well, you're not a Jew. Right? He could have said, have you followed the law of Moses since the day you were born? So here's a very important question. I mean, this is a life-changing, life-and-death question being asked by the eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch, the man of all minorities wrapped up into one who asks a very important question. And the question is, tell me, Philip, is there anything that will keep me from having Jesus? What hinders me? What is it? Tell me, whatever it is. He's saying, Philip, if there's anything that hinders me from being baptized, uh, because I want Jesus more than anything, what is it? You tell me, I'll take care of it. And Philip said, if you believe in your heart, you may. Believe what? The covenant. What covenant? That Jesus Christ of Nazareth died for those sins of the human race. And that means you, Ethiopian eunuch. And your sins are washed away by the blood. And Jesus relates to you like the rest of the body and says simply, if you'll believe on me, if you'll believe on me, come. And he said, answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He didn't say, I believe I better stop being a eunuch. <laughs> right? He simply said one thing. I believe 
that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And Philip could have said, well, that's not good enough. You need to be circumcised. You need to stop eating pork. You can't have milk with your meals anymore. You've got to, you, when you dress, you can't wear two kinds of uh, fabric together. You can't plant uh, anymore. Uh, you can't, you know, when you plant crops, you can't plant in two kinds together anymore. You can't have shellfish. And if you'll stop doing all these things, in fact, I'll give you a list. I know you've only got the book of Isaiah, but I'll get you a copy of, of Leviticus. And once you've read all that through, if you have any questions, you call me. Uh, here's my number, Jerusalem 12368. And uh, could have said to him, you know, if you want, or send me a Western Union telegram if you've got any questions, and I'll be sure and get back with you, you know, or we'll, we'll do lunch sometime. Well, he could have said any of those things. But he said, he commanded the chariot to stop. And they went both down into the water. Isn't it interesting that Philip, who would have been a good Jew from the day one wouldn't normally associate with an Ethiopian, much less a eunuch. They both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. <laughs> Isn't that something? Isn't that something? What hinders me? The only thing that hindered was his belief in Christ. Do you believe Jesus is Lord? If you believe Jesus is Lord, there's absolutely nothing to hinder you. And I think tonight we can see that God really does have a word for the gay community. There is a word to the eunuchs, to those who couldn't get married, to those who know that it just wasn't made for them to get married. They just were born that way. But if they'll do what the Ethiopian did, believe, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then they can be baptized. They can come into the covenant, the promise of Isaiah 56, and God is doing it today, today, today. He is drawing in the outcast from Israel, and he's making his house a house of prayer for all people. Praise the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for what you are doing and what you're doing to bring in all people. For Lord, the cross is all-inclusive. John 3.16 is all-inclusive. It is whosoever shall believe on you, Jesus. Whosoever includes anyone that will believe. Lord, if we confess with our heart, if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, proving that our sins are washed away, proving that our sins are nailed to the cross and they stayed in the grave while we came out redeemed, proving that you so loved us. There's nothing that can separate us from your love, nothing. Father, if we believe that, we're free. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Father, let us walk in this knowledge and grow in this knowledge and utilize this knowledge to bring others into the liberty that you died to give them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And he said, take hold of my covenant and I will be your God. Take hold of my covenant and with the angels trod. If you will keep my Sabbath and please be in your ways I'll be your God And add unto you many, many days Take hold of my covenant And 